Oh god, the horrible man is back. <laughs> but it's okay, I'm keeping the horrible man contained for now because he's not actually the main focus of today's video. He's important though and we'll have to let him out at some point. I dread it. Nope, today's focus is the one and only tattooed having, scoliosis looking, fluffy hat bearing doctor. It's Tony Tony Chopper. No, I'm just kidding, it's Law. Of course it's Law. Mr. Salad Fingers himself. I've wanted to talk about Law for a while now, not only because his entire story is so well laid out and explored, but because he's my second favourite character in the entire series. And let's be honest, Law is Toei's little honeypot boy. I'm not sure how popular he is in western fandom, but I know he is severely loved in Japan. He is absolutely the most popular non-straw hat if fan art merchandise and his stupid little hat are anything to go by. I'm serious, go to any One Piece event or anime convention and you'll see this goddamn leopard hat everywhere. It is insane. Toei also seemed to love him a lot considering how they animate him and the positions they put him in. There's literally a whole filler episode where Law is made into a pet. <laughs> You can't keep getting away with it! Also, why is Law put in so many situations where he's not only constantly beaten up, but he makes questionable noises? <laughs> <laughs> he can't keep getting away with it! Goodness, Toei, you can't keep doing this to me. I'm sure Oda is also fond of him, considering how big his involvement has been in the mainline story. Believe me when I say you don't torture a character to this extent unless you like them. That sounds weird, I know, but it's a writer thing, I swear. He's a character that can take a while to grow on you, since his introduction made him seem really weird. Why was his pre-time skip design so ugly? There is zero drip on this man. But what is a One Piece character without a little weirdness? And Law's no exception to that. I didn't really start liking Law until Punk Hazard. He'd caught my eye in Sabote due to his unexplained and nonsensical power. Unlike Kid's power that was easy to pick up due to how he could control metals of any kind, Law's kind of didn't make sense and wasn't properly explained and honestly is kind of never explained since he could just do things. Either way, he was a mystery from the get-go and there was an allure to him that was a constant presence, especially when saving Luffy and Marineford. The disconnect between Law's character upon introduction to his actual character within the mainline story is actually both pretty drastic and really funny, to the point that even his character songs made before and after we got a better insight of him are completely different. Amazing character development, really. But making a video with Law on his own is difficult, not because there's not enough to him, but because he has two cornerstones of his character that I feel need to be talked about in relevance with Law. Law's near entire personality, mentality, and character is built from and revolves around two specific characters that basically made him into who he is. These characters, of course, being Doflamingo and Corazon. Oda has marvelously intertwined Law with the Don Quixotes from the very beginning. All the way back in the Long Long Island arc, we saw Doflamingo's Jolly Roger, this symbol of course being a smiley face with a cross through it. When first meeting Law, his own Jolly Roger is extremely noticeable. Not only is it stuck on every member of his crew, but it's dead center on his own clothes as well. While there are plenty of similar Jolly Rogers out there with a the skull being the centerpiece, Law's and Doflamingo's prominently stand out. A detail that's hammered in further when we enter the slave auction, because what's plastered all over the walls within this building. Doflamingo's god damn Jolly Roger. It's pretty on the nose when you notice it. There's also bits and pieces of Law's first lines of dialogue that give us a subtle yet distinct perception of his psyche. Whenever Kid orders him to do anything, even as a joke, Law will always respond with don't tell me what to do and even sends out death threats with Kid's constant banter. While these interactions are humorous, it shows us Law has a stubborn temperament, especially in regards to his own choices. I don't want to say he's a brat, but... He's a brat. 
but there's a good reason for it, and I'll be getting into that later. From the start, Law has a very keen interest in Luffy, and we have no idea why. All we know is he wanted to meet him, to see what he could do, and even saved him after Marineford to keep him alive. Now, something else we know about Law is he clearly believes you must do something in return for someone else's favour. There's a heavy distrust embodied in Law that we see in later episodes, and Law doesn't believe in doing things unconditionally. Therefore, there's there's reason to believe Law sees this act of saving Luffy as a favour Luffy can repay him with after time. Enter Punk Hazard and the alliance deal he finally makes with Luffy. We also see it with Jean Bart, when he frees him first and then asks if he wants to be on his crew. So with only Sabote and Marineford, we find elements of Law's character that stand out. These elements being the stubbornness of his own will, the belief of give and take within the pirate world, and his distrust of others. Punk Hazard is when we see Law's true colours coming out. Out. It's also when he has a major glow up and stops looking like a greasy little rat. I don't know if it's the hat or the coat, but whatever's happening here is doing wonders compared to this creepy freak we saw in Sabote. Within Punk Hazard, we discover Law is a stickler for detail, making sure to plot and point every aspect of a situation before deciding on methods to use. It is blatantly obvious he is the exact opposite of Luffy in this and many other ways. While Law is the one who worries before events, Luffy is the we get there when we get there type of person. This contrast is what makes them such a fun duo, and why Law has no idea how to handle Luffy. <laughs> Luffy's further insistence of Law having to help all his crew if they're going to be in an alliance further confuses Law because, as explained before, Law believes in the act of give and take. The Straw Hats haven't done anything for him, so why should he do anything for the Straw Hats? He's asked specifically for Luffy's help to take down Kaido, and Luffy already has a debt to him that needs to be repaid. It's not that Law's being an asshole in this situation, although it may come across like that. It's simply a core belief of his character at this point. To him, outside of his trust circle, there's no goodwill of others. Only those who want to use you and those to be used. All right. I'll stop teasing. I'm sure you're all confused as to how everything I'm saying about Law correlates with the title of this video. Well, you see, the interesting part of Law isn't exactly his power, his ideals, or the peculiar parts of his character, but it's why he's like this. And this is why you cannot talk about Law without talking about those damn old Don Quixotes. I think it's finally time to pull the horrible man out of his cage. But just before I do, I'd like to bring up the concept of nature versus nurture. If you've never heard the term nature versus nurture, it's a long-standing debate in the world of biology, society, and the science of human development. It's basically the discussion of if you're born with certain elements of character, or if the environment around you determines all. Finding the balance between these two things is the most difficult part to study and prove, and it leads to the age-old question, can someone be born evil? I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. In my opinion, Doflamingo and Corazon perfectly embody this question, and Law is smack dab in the middle of it. In my previous Doflamingo video, I had a lot of people saying I missed a key factor of Doflamingo, and this key factor was Treble. Many believe Doflamingo was groomed by Treble to be an ultimate evil, that Treble's influence led Doflamingo down the path of immoral power, and there's plenty of good points behind it. But I left him out because that is a whole other debate in itself a debate of if Doflamingo was really born evil or if he was pushed into it, which is exactly what we'll be discussing now. I think the key factor here is the differentiation in Treble using Doffy and Treble conditioning Doffy. There is no doubt Treble used Doflamingo for power. He wanted a kingdom of his own and he saw a kid with the color of the Supreme King. You'd just be crazy to not immediately swipe that kid up and get on his good side. But did Treble make Doflamingo into a monster? That depends on your outlook and there are a few factors of Doffy's story that sway me either way. Corazon himself believes Doflamingo was born a monster. He says he doesn't understand how a man such as him came from people as kind as his parents. And even he's terrified of the devil Doflamingo is. But those are only Corazon's words, and we know he has a bias against his blood brother. When we look into it, it's very easy to believe Doflamingo was majorly influenced by those around him. The Celestial Dragons would have definitely had an effect on him. He grew up in the Holy Lands for 10 years, 
surrounded by egotistical bastards who only looked out for themselves. I guess the question is if the words and actions of his parents were stronger than the influence of the celestial dragons around him. From there, Doflamingo was chased down and beaten by the common people, watching as his mother died in front of him due to the foolish decisions of his father. It's very likely that this may have turned him into a monster, and it'd be understandable if that were the case. But what I believe needs to be focused on the most is the murder of his own father, and the contrast between him and Corazon within this moment. In my Doflamingo video, I explained Corazon and Doffy had gone through the exact same situation, and I don't mean after the events of Treble, but up until the point he murdered their father. It's true Corazon was younger and therefore may have had less of a grasp on the situation, but it seems pretty prominent at this point that he has a very solid understanding of what Doffy is doing. Their father had made an incredibly foolish decision and he pulled his family down with him, but in the end it was one big fuck up none of them had predicted. When Doflamingo's mother died, instead of crying for her, he felt nothing but rage over his father. When the common people caught them, his father begged for them to let his sons go and take him only, Doflamingo noticeably trying to struggle out of his arms. When they were strung up to the wall, even while his father continued to beg for the safety of his children, Doffy still felt nothing but rage at, primarily, his dad. And finally, we loop back around to this moment of Doflamingo holding a gun to his father's head. There was a pure rage within this kid, one Corazon was terrified of, and Treble simply handed him the gun. Yes, Treble promised him power, but it was at the cost of his dad's life. I don't believe this was Treble grooming Doflamingo to be evil at this point, but to see if Doflamingo would really do it. And between Corazon's begging to Doflamingo screaming, we hear his father say one one last thing before being shot by his own son. Do Flamingo. Rosinante. What has she got, Chioya de Gomena? And even after hearing that, at ten years old, Do Flamingo shoots him. Now, this is where I ask, were Corazon to be in that position? Were Treble to offer Corazon a gun and a promise of power, would Corazon have shot his own father with the promise of glory? The answer is probably not, because this is their blood father, and at this point, the only man left in the world who is giving them his unconditional love. And this is what I mean. Doflamingo from the get-go was a kid full of rage. There are plenty of factors in his environment that could have turned him into this, but we must ask how much of this is Doffy and how much of this is influence. Even with the love his father gave him, his anger was far too great, and he shot him in cold blood. Corazon and Doflamingo represent two sides here, one being a lawful good, and the other being a chaotic evil. And between them, Law enters into their lives at 10 years old. The exact age Doflamingo was when he shot his dad. And there is no way that's a coincidence. Just like Doflamingo, Law was filled with an uncontrollable bloodlust, and this immediately struck Doffy's interest. At this point, most know that Law had a pretty awful life. He had a great first 10 years with a mother, father and sister who loved him, until it all went to shit with the outbreak of lead disease. Law was forced to watch his village burn, his loved ones die and his existence be seen as that of a monster due to the negligence and misinformation pumped out by the world government. Seeing so much grief and trauma fit into such a little body is harrowing and there's no doubt something broke in Law that day. Afterwards, Law wanted nothing more than to kill, and the way Doffy and Law reflect each other is masterfully done. A child who had a great first 10 years, who had two parents and a sibling that loved him, who lost his home, who was filled with rage, and was seen as a monster by those around him. It's no surprise as to why Doflamingo saw such potential in Law, even proclaiming Law was exactly like him at that age. So one path was presented to Law, a path of anger and violence. Here we can see where Law picked up his habits as an adult. He's distrusting of those around him, especially of authority due to what he'd gone through in Flevance. He believes in the action of give and take due to the Don Quixote family's methods of needing to prove himself to be accepted. And he elaborates on his will of free choice because, well, we'll get to that. 
from the methods of the Don Quixote family, we can see unconditional love doesn't exist with Doffy. It's very possible any form of love in general doesn't exist within Doffy at all. And it's terrifying to think that this man raised Law for three years of his early life. And let me tell you, he messed that kid up. He messed him up to the point that caught us on crying for Law. Simply showing pity for Law impacted Law for the rest of his life. While Law fights Doffy, he says he'll never forget the tears Corazon shed for him. Because for three years, Doflamingo didn't show an ounce of pity for a kid as broken as Law. For three years, Law was trained and manipulated by a man as evil as Doflamingo, making sure to build and build that rage. And all it took was six months of being with Corazon to calm this poor kid's heart. All it took was words and actions of love to quell the rage Doflamingo had been nourishing for three years. While Doflamingo presented Law a path of anger, Corazon presented Law a path of freedom. Freedom to be who he wants to be, to choose what he wants to do, and a life where his decisions are his alone. And this stuck with Law, to the point he doesn't want anyone telling him what to do, because that isn't what Corazon would have wanted. But, of course, there's a catch. There's a tragedy with Law's character in regards to his freedom. Because while Corazon helped him see Doflamingo's manipulative ways, Doffy still ultimately got to him. Even as an adult, we see Doffy's ways ingrained within him. When Doflamingo told Law his free will wasn't his own, and that his will belonged to him, well, he's got a point. In Punk Hazard, Law has a particular line of dialogue that's pretty infamous at this point. He says to Tashigi, the weak don't get to choose how they die. <laughs> It seems pretty cruel for a person such as Law to say, until we arrive in Dress Rosa and Doflamingo says something absolutely bone chilling. <laughs> He tells Law, do you remember what I taught you? The weak don't get to choose how they die. It's no surprise such lessons had been embedded into Law, and seeing the repercussions of Doffy taking three years of his early life is terrifying in itself. But the most upsetting part to me, and the worst thing Doflamingo had done to Law, is his idea of unconditional love. Just the same way Doflamingo never exhibited it, Law never believed in it. He finds it hard to believe in the good of people, to understand genuine kindness, and this is one of the reasons Luffy baffles him so much. Law doesn't understand why Luffy is helping him to such an extent, especially considering taking out Doflamingo wasn't part of the Grand Kaido plan. Putting aside the citizens of Dressrosa, Luffy can see how much it means to Law to take down Doffy, so of course he's going to do it. But with how much Doflamingo beat and battered Law in his youth, the concept of Luffy's kindness for those he cares about just doesn't register with him, to the point he even tells Luffy to leave and that their alliance is over, because he doesn't want to owe Luffy anything. Luffy, of course, doesn't give a shit, and does what he wants anyways. It's a freedom Law could never dream of, and the saddest part of all of this is how it affected his relationship with Corazon. It's not that Law's own will was being controlled by Doffy exactly, it's more his outlook had been changed forever. Or, at least, until Luffy. It's no secret Corazon had saved Law because he had the D initial, knowing Doffy would try to kill or completely use Law if he ever found that out. But Corazon quickly grew fond of this annoying little gremlin throughout their travels. He saw the way doctors and nurses treated Law alike, hunting him down due to being a survivor of Flevance, and this caused Corazon's heart to break. He couldn't bear to see a child as young and hurt as Law be rejected and harmed, both emotionally and physically. Corazon's reasons for saving Law turned from something rational with purpose to something completely irrational and unconditional. Law, however, didn't come to understand this until years later. Law's entire fight with Doflamingo is centered around Corazon, and Law is doing everything in his power to achieve what he believed Corazon wanted. When Doflamingo has been knocked down for the first time, Law believing Doffy to be near dead, he says, Corazon, I can finally attain your ambition. Throughout his entire life, Law had lived believing Corazon wanted to keep him alive for a reason. And because Corazon shed tears for him, showed him both empathy and pity, Law dedicated his entire being to Corazon. From his tattoos, to his Jolly Roger, to the name of his crew. 
everything is for Corazon, and he doesn't care if he dies for it. Law still didn't have any true freedom at this point, and this is all because of what Doffy had taught him. This is why when Luffy finally takes out Doflamingo in the sky, with the entirety of Dressrosa watching him, the image of Law looking up with them gives you goosebumps. He stares at Luffy floating in the sky, the image of his saviour and a true symbol of freedom, and Law finally makes sense of both Luffy and Corazon's actions when talking to Sengoku. For me, we get one of the most heartwarming moments in the entire series here. Sengoku asks Law what he thinks Corazon died for, and Law explains they were meant to escape together, which is why he single-mindedly lived to kill Doflamingo on his behalf. Directly after saying this, he says, but I don't know if this is how he wants me to live. And finally, Sengoku delivers a line that turns Law on his head, and gives Law his real freedom back. <laughs> Don't try to find a reason for somebody's love. <laughs> The belief Doffy pushed on Law, that your life must be useful to mean something, has been pulled from him, and that final string has been cut. In the same way he no longer has to live his life in debt to Corazon with this realisation, he doesn't have to see Luffy as a saviour, but as a friend. Sengoku tells Law the only thing he needs to do for Corazon is remember him, and so long as he does that, he can live his life as he likes. Law is noticeably shaken by this, because why wouldn't he be? Everything he'd done up to this point was with the belief of repaying Corazon, thinking he needed to take down Doffy for the sake of his saviour. Doflamingo's methods had been programmed into him since he was 10, his existence needing purpose for something, and Sengoku has helped him see he's allowed to just live. He didn't have a debt to repay, he didn't have a purpose to fulfil, and most importantly, he was loved unconditionally. Luffy saved Law for the same reasons Corazon had, and now Law can start a better, healthier chapter of his life with Luffy as his friend, completely and utterly free of Doflamingo's pull on his life and soul. It's so sweet, I can feel myself melting into a disgusting little puddle while I'm saying this. So with all of this, if we go back to the nature versus nurture question, we're clearly showing the effects of what unconditional love can do. It's true Law was being nurtured by Doffy to become an evil and cruel being, and Doflamingo was clearly enraged he'd lost such a promising tool, but I doubt it was in Law's nature to become so vicious. It's why he shatters with Corazon's love and care, and why Corazon stuck with him for the rest of his life. Doflamingo, on the other hand, was shown this exact same type of unconditional love. His father was an idiot and he'd put them in such an awful situation, but he still loved his sons with all he had. And even with their blood connection, and even being the only person in the world at that point who loved Doflamingo unconditionally, Doffy still pulled that trigger. As bad as the Celestial Dragons are, somehow I don't think they're taught to shoot their parents, and this is why the lines between Doffy's evil nature versus his horrible upbringing completely blur. So to throw a poor boy in the middle of it all, to show what something as sweet as love can do for a tortured soul, is honestly one of the best stories One Piece has ever created. I'll admit I've always been quite biased towards stories with the lessons of love, in all forms, not just romantic, and Law's whole character truly hit me with waves and waves of emotion. Unsurprisingly, Law is all about the human heart. The way it breaks, the way it heals, and the way it loves. So how can I not love a character quite literally covered in and surrounded by the concept of love? He's my baby girl cringe wife and I hold him oh so tightly in my arms. And with that, Thanks for watching. As you could probably tell, Law means a lot to me. His connection to Doflamingo and Corazon has always been an interesting one, and I hope I was able to voice it all properly. The discussion of nature versus nurture is one I've also constantly had with my friends regarding Law, Corazon, and Doflamingo, and please remember I am not a psychologist. So I probably didn't get everything right here, but you know, it's a YouTube video, so it's whatever. If there's something you think I missed with Law's character and his involvement with the Don Quixotes, please comment about it. I love hearing 
sharing all the opinions and observations you guys have since it really helps me see the bigger picture. If there's anything anyone would like to hear me talk about, one piece or otherwise, please let me know. And I'll see you in whatever I make next. See ya!